My name is Max Vermark and I'm the CEO of a business called Sigma Rock. We, we founded this company just about two years ago with two colleagues of mine, David Barrett, who's currently the chairman of the group, and Charles Trigg, who's the technical director. And we started with a clean sheet of paper, blank in terms of cash at the start for sure, but also idea, in terms of, an, of idea and approach to this, to this sector. Because when you think construction materials, especially heavy construction materials, you think cement, the great power, you think aggregates out of quarries, you think concrete, uh, asphalt, blocks, but perhaps some services. And that's sort of where the spectrum ends. And that spectrum is defined fundamentally by um, a few deep characteristics. First and foremost, the product is cheap, it's heavy, it's abundantly available. And if you group all of these things together, what you get is that it's effectively a commodity industry depending on transport, dependent on transport, uh, where transport is a heavy component of, of the overall price of the goods. And so if you want to differentiate yourself, the fundamental way of going about that is quality, not just of the product, but of the service that you offer. That's the only real differentiator you can, you can bring to the party. So we started to think about this industry and thinking, how do we approach this in a slightly different manner? Because this traditional business model that everybody's applied, or all the big groups have applied to date, is a market share volume-based approach, which basically means you try to get plant and equipment everywhere to increase the market share you've got so that you are the biggest volume supplier. Now, over time, what that means, especially in a market where infrastructure is already built and where it's mostly replacement, your margins start to compress. Logically, what you need to do is drive synergies, drive economies of scale. And that naturally drives you into a position where you have to start uh, putting everybody into a hub, a central hub. Now, could try to combine that thought with the thought of a, a, an industry which is fundamentally hyper-local. And what you get into is the same problem that everybody has when you try to ring the power company or the water company. You've got an issue, you ring up, and you ring up and you reach someone 300 miles away who's got no clue what you're, what you're doing. Put yourself in the shoes of a builder of a house. He can see the concrete plant down the road, which is going to supply his concrete for the next big pour. A downpour comes down, the site's flooded, he can't accept the load, and he rings up and he gets a central service office somewhere. That fundamentally doesn't work. So we stepped back and said, okay, we're not going to approach this industry this way. We're going to do it through smaller platforms of um, compatible businesses, one, two, three businesses maximum, 10 million EBITDA, 15 million EBITDA. Because that fundamentally means that one individual can run that platform. And if you then take that across the group, you've got the distance between your, your customer, the person that buys your product, and the CEO of the entire business is effectively one step, the MD in between. So that model we run, we, we call that, there we go, we call that, um, we've used three terms, invest, improve, integrate. We buy a good business at a good price. We improve that company because fundamentally every company can be improved. And then we integrate that into a cluster or platform, which is then run by one individual who reports directly to me. We've been going through this process for now for uh, about two years. Um, and we're two, we've, start, we've basically started our second platform at the end of, of last year. The first platform were two businesses, Ronnie Jersey and Ronnie Guernsey, the Channel Islands, and a shipping division, shipping business. We bolted those together into one platform. Um, the cluster would run at 4 million, 4.5 million EBITDA roughly when we bought it. The combination, the operational improvements, the restructuring of the company, now, this business, now this entity now runs well above six. And that's a jump of more than a million pound in EBITDA in just one year. We didn't fire anyone. We didn't hike prices. It's just how you run that business differently. And I'll come to how that works a bit later. We then went on to create a second platform, Allen Concrete, with two operational sites, Poundfield Products. Allen Concrete specialist in fence post, fencing, um, anything that has to do with outdoors precast, wet cast concrete. Poundfield Products, and these are all nice aerial views of the operational sites, um, has 25 patents in retaining walls, uh, flooring systems, big infrastructure. Individually, these businesses are fine. I mean, they're nice to own. You put them together, you start sharing customer lists. You start sharing operational practice. You start to cross stock in, the, in each other's yards. You start to cross produce. So that entity as a cluster, as a platform, makes much more sense than each of these businesses individually. We bought both at a very nice multiple of around six mark. When we're done with it, it will run at a much higher pace than it has ever done before. Okay, now we're not that big yet. We are um, 
Broker notes tell us 40 million turnover close to for the year. So we're not that big in terms of scale of this industry yet. I put some images there and you'll find them in, in the presentations too. We are already active in every single uh, substream of this industry. We supply cement, we supply aggregates, um, we supply asphalt, which goes into, for instance, and these are all projects we delivered, resurfacing of airports, um, security barriers around uh, Heathrow Terminal 3. Um, a picture which isn't on here, massive sea defense projects are that up down there, a mile and a half long concrete uh, sea defenses of two and a half, three ton blocks that we cast and supply there. So across the spectrum are active, which is quite essential because it means that we already have internal to the group all the knowledge and skill that you need to expand across, across this, this sector. Right, so, um, so far the conceptual bit, let's look at um, what we've achieved in sort of hard numbers and, uh, and performance. Rone platform, excellent safety record. This year, um, last year, LTI free, lost time injury free. That's a, hardly anyone does that in the industry. Same thing for the first half of this year. Plant availability, excellent. We continue to improve that business. I said it's running above the six million mark for last year already, and we'll continue to do better as we continually input uh, more improvement uh, initiatives. PPG platform, now that's a new term. Allen Concrete, Poundfield Products, the two brands continue to exist, yet to make it life easier of our customers who want to shop with both and only want to have one credit account or one customer account with us, we created an umbrella brand above it, PPG, Precast Products Group, that offers the entirety of the spectrum to the customers that would buy this. And these are the big contractors, these are the juicers, the TPs and such, and so on. Um, improvement process across the two businesses, Started in the beginning of this year, we're three quarters done with it. And if you go to the sites currently, and you would have visited them last year, you will see a world of difference in terms of operational efficiency, quality, availability of machines, of plants, uh, the segregation of stocking, loading and production. All of that wasn't there. It's just by putting some best practice in place, you get there. <coughs> now, if you translate all of that into, um, into for some numbers, there we are. This is our first half results. For the first uh, period last year versus this uh, first period this year, first half this year, 52% increase in revenue, generating 100% increase in EBITDA, 140% increase in profit before tax, 90% up in EPS. Now, uh, the cynics among you will go, aha, you just levered the business um, to create that EPS uh, uplift. Well, we didn't. Our debt to EBITDA ratio has been 1.9 times from the day we got going, from the very first of January 2017. Yet, if you then look at what the business really owns already, 49 million pounds worth of tangible assets, that's plant, land, quarries, equipment, 82 million pounds of assets overall. If you translate that into, um, and by the way, we're very cash generative. Uh, if you translate that into some, into some numbers, net assets over market cap, 98% currently, which means that your investment in shares is entirely backed by hard assets that the business owns. Tangible assets over net assets, 93%. So it's not sitting in, uh, in goodwill or in, in intangibles, it's sitting in real plant and equipment. It's a real solid asset backing, um, which is great to cross cycle. Gearing ratio, totally, totally acceptable. And then if you annualize our first half return over into, uh, on invested capital, we're at 9%. So that combined with the asset backing is quite extraordinary. Good, moving on. The question then becomes maybe, um, you've created platform number one, and that's the Channel Islands. It's roughly where it should be. You can't really bolt much onto that because it's a self-contained island-based market. We created platform number two, which is Island Concrete Poundfield. That is ripe for expansion. And the question you may ask is, where do you get those transactions from? Where do you find quality businesses at a good multiple? Well, there's two sources, really. Source number one are private um, owners. Um, about 14, 15,000 of those in the wider European area. 500 of those, uh, we did a, a, a good search last year, good, good, good overview of the market. 500 of those fit within our um, criteria and also our ge geography of operation, which is, if you take a rule of thumb, an hour's flight from London maximum in all directions. Um, if you combine that across the UK, you get 300 million in EBITDA. Now, that's the UK-wide opportunity list that we've identified. If we get 10, 15, 20% of that, we're already quite happy with our exposure UK-wise, and we can then move on to Belgium, Holland, Germany, France, and so on. Why would these people sell? Well, they sell, um, private individuals very often sell because they just have enough. They want to do something else. 
uh, there's no succession. Um, or there is succession, but the children don't want to work in the industry. So then they, they just monetize and, 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 and move on. Uh, why is there a possibility for us to make these companies better if they're already quite good when we got, when we got them? Um, what you typically see with an owner-operated business or, or someone that is an independent is that it's either a commercial-minded person or an operator who decided to, to go at it alone and therefore has the business focused entirely along the lines that he or she felt most competent in. You take Allen Concrete, that was an operator-built business, and the business from an operational perspective was very, very good. Commercially, the philosophy was, if the product's good, it will sell itself. <coughs> now, unfortunately, that doesn't really always work. Uh, Allen Concrete, sorry, Poundfield Products was the opposite. There, we had a very good commercially-minded person who understood the problems that the customer wanted to see solved, and the operational side was, was, was nowhere near where it should be. The other side is divestments from majors. Uh, you take the Lafarges, the Semexes. They typically run into a situation where either they want to restructure their balance sheet or they have to restructure their balance sheet. And what you then get is that they start to divest some bits of their company. Now, we're really well positioned to pick those up for two reasons. Firstly, we are an industry buyer. We're not a financial buyer, which usually scares these major groups into selling to them. We're not going to strip the assets, fire half the staff. We're going to treat, treat those businesses in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sensible way. Secondly, we aren't um, running into antitrust problems because we are very focused locally in pockets so we can actually uh, very easily buy uh, uh, companies without actually having to, to, uh, to go through the, the check of, of anti-competitive uh, positioning in the market. Now, where is the value for the, the Sigma Rock shareholder? Um, you take the same example with Rone, these businesses have always been centrally managed and the managers locally manage up and they don't care, well, they don't care, they care, but they don't have time to deal with their local customer in a local environment. They're constantly filling out reports, reporting back up. Set the company free, let the people actually run the company, let them deal with customers, give them some autonomy, some, 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 uh, some pride in what they're doing and you get immediately an uplift in, in what that company generates as profitability. We do that without too much trouble. We've been part of those environments ourselves. We know exactly what it looks like. So to finish off this talk before, uh, before some questions, um, I've put a, a one slide summary in here so you can, uh, so you can take away. On the, on the left hand side, the key numbers for, uh, for the business in the first half of this year. On the right hand side, where we are currently operating with all our brands. So that's three operational sites plus the Channel Islands. Obviously we want to expand here. Obviously we want to expand elsewhere either through platform number two or a third platform we'll create. Um, and as soon as that's ready to go, we will we'll come and tell you. Thank you very much. On that slide with your nav, which you displayed with your nav, on a little, a little star it had before PPA process? What's PPA process? Purchase price allocation. So as, as you buy a business, uh, it's required by IFRS and IS accounting rules that you can t take a good look at the intangibles that you bought and you reallocate them. So typically when you buy a business, the balance sheet has depreciated assets over it and you end up paying some goodwill. Now that goodwill is not a fair value representation of what the business is really worth. So that intangible needs to be reallocated across the assets in the balance sheet. And that, pre that PPA process therefore needs to happen. And typically what it does is it improves the overall perspective because a, a goodwill chunk that sits there will be redistributed to actual, actual assets that the business has. And so that process is going through. And as soon as that's done, we expect the, the total assets, uh, the net assets and the total assets picture to improve in terms of where it's, how it's distributed. Okay, and just one last question. Have you done any modeling work as to say if there's a repeat of recessions or slowdowns, what effect would that have on you? Or do you anticipate? It's hard yeah. to answer. No, no, that's, that's, a, that's a tricky one to, um, to look at. So what we have done, and that's just out of good corporate governance, is, and that we did that earlier this year, is uh, to put scenarios in place in the business. What happens if there's a catastrophic Brexit, for instance? So that we are prepared with a list of actions, potential actions that we can take if uh, um, the market has a real, real hard shock. Because that what you then need to do is to prepare your business to not strip it down completely, start firing and shutting down things, so that if that shock made its way through the market, then you're stuck with a half, a half broken down company. So that plan is for sure in place. Modeling in terms of what happens throughout the cycle, we absolutely do, we do that constantly. Um, the reason 
Um, we do that constantly is because we want to have a look or have an understanding of where we are in terms of margin defense. And that's a key point that we always try to make to everybody. We purchase companies which are, in principle, one of the last ones to get hit by a slowdown because of the uniqueness of the product, the uniqueness of the location, um, the specific service it can offer. And that's that margin defensibility. So that when a cycle hits, both vol volumes will go down because there's less demand, but that we don't suffer a price decrease. And so that our, our margins overall stay the same. Um, how do you look to pay for your acquisitions? We look, so there's, there's going to be phases as the group, the group evolves. As we are um, a, a relatively small entity to, so far, the growth will be funded through a combination of internal generated cash, and we're quite cash generative. Um, the debt facilities we have in place, which we will grow with the size of the business, and then obviously equity issue. Uh, at some point in time, the business will be of such a size that the, the internal generation of cash will be enough to fund further expansion. And you can actually uh, sort of visualize that. Most of the independent companies you, buy, you would buy are anywhere between 10 and 30 million pounds worth in size. Now, a proportion of that you could fund through debt. And if the, the business is a bit bigger, the cash generation will, will allow uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the, uh, the equity part to be funded. But that's only if you buy smaller entities. If you buy bigger entities, then some, some, um, uh, some equity will be re required. And they're always earnings enhancing? That's the thing I was going to come to. We, what we always do is we have a number of criteria in terms of before we acquire a business, sort of to model it. And we say, we want this business to be earnings accretive if we don't even touch it. So we buy it as is, the generation of, 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 of a profit after tax of that business versus the price we pay needs to be such that it's earnings accretive already. And then we start work on it. So that, that's again for, to the benefit of the shareholders. And when I say earnings accretive, it's fully diluted earnings accretive. And that protects all of you from, from um, well, it actually, what it does, it makes everybody benefit from that earnings enhancement constantly. All your operations to date are in the UK and Channel Islands. Is that the intention going forwards? Or if the right opportunity arose in, in Europe, would you consider that as well? Um, we have grown uh, in the UK first because our, the, all our shareholders are basically uh, UK based. And so we wanted to make sure that they were comfortable that we could operate in a market they understand well, which they have statistics on, they can read all the documentation on all the time. We are obviously, and we've always said that we want to have a geography, geogra geographic diversification into countries that we know. So that would be Belgium, Holland, Germany, France. These are regions I've operated in a long time before that, that other members of the group have operated in a long time. So at some point in time, we will make the jump to the other side of the channel uh, as soon as the opportunity arises. Which is a which which fits in the criteria I just I just mentioned to the to the gentleman at the front, which is, let's not do anything to that business. Is it already earnings enhancing at the price we can buy it at? And what is good then is, economies don't evolve in the same at the same speed or uh, don't have the same impact of recessions or crises as as the cycle goes through. So you get that geographic diversification by being present across a multitude of a multitude of jurisdictions. Did you? anticipate making further uh, sort of bolt-on acquisitions or is it likely, quite likely that a acquisition of scale uh, is going to happen? Uh, both are likely. Um, we didn't go after very big acquisitions in the first year and in the second year, uh, by the way, because what you naturally get into is a territory of what, what's called a reverse takeover, which means that uh, I have to reapply for admission to AIM as the new entity that is created of the existing plus the new. And that process is just as complicated as a, as a fresh relisting. Um, therefore makes it more costly and more tricky, well, more tricky, more complicated to put in place. It takes more time. And so we thought it's better to grow this company initially with smaller acquisitions, smaller bolt-ons, or even platforms of smaller entities that we group together. Because the opportunity there for shareholders is just as great as with a bigger entity uh, in terms of value creation we could do the same job on both, but it doesn't cost it as much time and effort to get it done. And for that reason, um, uh, we went that way. Now, it doesn't, th that doesn't mean that if the right thing comes along at the right price, that we wouldn't go after it and do, and do take the cost on of the RTO, but then we need to me absolutely see the value creation in it. Well, I came a bit late. I'm sorry for being a bit late, and you may have answered this already. I don't know you, and therefore somebody else can tell me if you've already answered this question. What's the difference between you and Breeden, other than size? 
Well, that's it's a good what point. What do they do that you don't do? Yeah. And what do you do that, that they, they don't, don't do? do? Okay, that's 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 a really fair question. So Breeden, um, Peter Tom set up Breeden, and he was the chairman and the formerly CEO of of Aggregate Industries, which is now part of Lafarge Holcim. And Breeden have um, been extremely successful at a at the right implementation of business model number one, which is on the on the few first slides, which is a volume and market share driven business model which means that you seek to have to gain coverage of a market from border to border, from coast to coast, so that you are in the prime position to be the supplier of choice to the main projects. Now, that logic works as long as your cost savings and your economies of scales and synergies uh, outpace the compression of margin you'll, you'll find over time, because you're basically driving volume, and to drive volume, you need to be also a cheap supplier, not only a supplier uh, of the product itself. So Breeden have done a really good job over time to, to, to maintain that model in a successful way. Other majors have started to, to, to find some, some difficulty in keeping up the momentum there. So that's the, that's the Breeden side of things. We have a slightly different approach to the same market, which is more um, akin to what Summit Materials have done in the United States or what CRH used to do uh, 20 years ago when they were a, a slightly smaller entity, which is instead of going after a, co a coast-to-coast coast -coast coverage and a market share model, we only operate there where we really want to be present. And so that smaller pocket, smaller platforms, hubs, whatever you want to call them, of compatible business in, a, in an area. The benefit we see of that is, imagine you have a cycle that turns, if you're a present, oh well, if you're present everywhere, the logic that happens is, there's less demand for the product, but you still have all that plant to, uh, to maintain, all these people to employ. You're stuck with a problem that your balance sheet becomes a heavy one, which is we, we try to avoid that by only operating in those areas where we know that margin defense is possible, where we will be a great supplier, perhaps a market leading supplier, but without being present everywhere in between. So to say this very complicated, long explanation, it's a, an, an acid light version uh, of a similar model. But you are going to be um, doing what they do, but on an I, basically selling the same stuff. Oh yeah, uh, that but they do. So that you're you're going to be in competition with Breedon, but in a localized for sure. In, in a different way. A lo localized, absolutely. We we compete with everybody on a localized scale. The Tarmax, the CRHs, the Semexes, everybody competes with us. But if we're present in their in their specific location. Um, two questions: a short one and a longer one. Um, you, you showed that some of your sourcing of deals comes from the independents and families on the one side and from the major materials manufacturers on the other. They're very, very different sources. Which one is more important going forward for you? They're equally important and they actually have a, a counter-cyclical timing. Um, independents, at least oh, the, the major, the, the independents that we like to buy are quality businesses. They typically aren't for sale when the market turns down because the family hunkers down and says, well, we've seen this all, all before, we'll just stick it out and then, and then um, sit it out and then, and then come back on the market to sell three, four, five years later. And so they won't sell at a, at a discount. Whereas majors, when the economy gets tougher, uh, find themselves in a the position that they have to restructure their balance sheet and are more likely to sell in that environment. So they're sort of counter-cyclical, which means that we, don't necessarily have a period in time that we can't find anything interesting at a right price to continue the journey of this company. Okay, thanks. And the second question, um, you indicated, if I understood correctly, <laughs> when you make an acquisition, um, they get a significant amount of local autonomy, mm -hmm. and then it reports directly, the managing director reports directly into you. So the question is, how much bandwidth have you got to make more acquisitions before you run out of time in the day? Um, and how much depth is there underneath you in the management structure of the company? Okay, so if depth means capacity to absorb responsibilities in this, in this model, I'll answer that secondly. Um, if you think about it, so the managing director is always a person that we appoint and that we put in place because that person has all confidence that, that we need in, in them. They are always um, have a right hand, which is a, a chartered accountant, FD. Um, businesses of that type need to be run by a local MD because they are the only person that really knows what's going on locally. We've got two platforms, that's two MDs. And these platforms can individually grow to 10, 15 million EBITDA without actually needing a different, a different structure. So then if you say 10, that means 20 million EBITDA already. We're currently trending towards the nine and a half, 10 mark something. So then you say, well, how many MDs can I manage? 
well, it's the same logic as a private equity firm, which is where I, where I used to work. Five, six, seven, not that much of a problem. So you, you say seven times 10 is 70. Now, then you've got already uh, a, a very significant increase in size of this company. Then I've got a number of people that worked with me for a long time and are working with us uh, now of really high caliber. So Charles Trigg is for sure one. David Barrett is another one. David's obviously the chairman, but operationally still involved because it's just, that's what his, his fascination has always been. Um, Ian, who's at the back of the room, joined us recently. On the board, we've got Patrick Dahlberg, who was CEO of Holson for the whole of Europe. The skill and the capacity to absorb more is, is, not, is not the issue. We can, we can continue to expand at the same pace well beyond uh, the numbers that I've, that I've so far thrown, uh, thrown forward before we actually start to think, okay, well, this starts to become a bit big. How does your customer base differ, differ from Breeden's customer base? Um, that's on a case-by-case -case basis, and it doesn't necessarily differ. It's very local. Um, so you take a customer for the PPG platform, Poundfield and Allen, they, that's bigger merchants, the Juicens, the Travis Perkinses, small merchants and specialist stockists, and then councils because the sea defense work is very much a council-led project. Uh, breeding would sell to the same people different products. So the customer base doesn't differ. Yeah? So how, how, how do you manage to have a, a more protected and higher margin if your customer's the same? A product, use, a product sold. So for instance, all uh, Poundfield products has 20 plus patterns and trademarks on the shape and the size and the, sc and the scope and the, uh, the, the performance of some of its uh, retaining wall system of some of its flooring systems. Uh, it has it developed a real skill in terms of sea defense work, which is very unique for a business of that small size, where you, where you supply mile and a half long projects. So the margin defense comes in where you as a company are able to supply a product and a service on time and of quality that someone else can't. Is that patent protection um, typical? That sounds unusual. Not, it depends. Across your, across um, your businesses as a whole. Um, so f it, it's not usual. So it's quite a unique business from that perspective. And that's also what drove Tarmac uh, to do a, a partnership with us on one of the products that we actually don't uh, manufacture because of the scale, which is it's so huge, each section that would clog up our yard so much that we couldn't actually expand in the other products. So um, it's a unique setup. But what you will see very often is trademarks that people try to protect a product design by putting a trademark and a name on it. So it's quite a unique, unique feature. Could I ask you how much cash you've actually invested in the business? Yep. As a, and talk a little bit about your, the option um, uh, and management incentivization structure yep. and, uh, and the cash remuneration for the board and how you've sought to set that, those levels. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Between uh, David, myself and a few, and, and Charles, we were on about a percent, a bit more than a percent of the company overall. Sorry, what percent? One. One percent. Yeah. Um, to date, uh, we are constantly buying shares as with every uh, equity raise, we participate in that raise. To give you an example, my 100% of my gross salary last year went back into the business, so I didn't earn a cent uh, gross. Um, so that's really to show the commitment there. We have, in terms of management incentive scheme, it's an option scheme, very straight option scheme, which was uh, put in place in dialogue with the, the main shareholders at the start. Um, it has a strike price at 40 pence uh, and vests over years in equal tranches. So it's a fairly straightforward uh, system. And we are in, um, incentivized to perform because anything that has to do with uh, bonuses, for instance, would only come into place if we create uh, total shareholder returns in terms of share price rise. Now, board remuneration, that's all. There's a, a whole table in the, in the annual report that details that. But there's a fairly standard board fee of about £25,000 a head. Um, for, for the non-executive executive directors. That was set uh, in, in taking a, a global view of all companies of our size and what the average uh, looks like there. And then we, we took that, that, that average fee. It's actually quite interesting that for that kind of a fairly small remuneration, because we do six, seven, eight board meetings a year, and uh, if you count them all together, with the, the, the standard ones, the four or five we do, plus then the, the ones in between to, to approve acquisitions or other things. Uh, uh, someone like Patrick Dahlberg is, is part of our board who has, has been who ran multi-billion dollar uh, uh, chunks of, of, Lafar of Lafarge Holson. So um, I think we've got a, a good composition and a good, and a good structure which is just in line with everybody else.
Looking at the Stockopedia report, um, the negatives on, on, on the Consig Maroc are the, re the return on capital, which is less than 4%, and return on equity at about 5%. And on some of the other companies we've been seeing, these are up in the 10, 15, 20% levels. Yeah, so Do you have any comment on this? I'm, I'm not sure how they cal what they calculated and how ca they calculated uh, the, uh, the, the statistics there. I put a statistic up earlier. Our return on invested capital uh, which we calculated together with our uh, accountants, is if you annualize it for 18, about 9. Um, that will increase over time because um, we've set up the entity and the central structure to absorb, as I said, a much, to absorb and deal with a much larger entity than we currently are. So that Topco will continue to be diluted over, this, over the size of the total business. And so that number will, uh, on current trading, improve. These numbers may um, be distorted or skewed by a, a, a number of un, non-underlying uh, items which we report. So if, when we buy a, um, a new company, it very often is the case that there are a number of things that need to be dealt, done and dealt with in the first year to set that company up to be a part of our business. So there is a restructuring effort where a number of people just need to be let go because they won't fit um, with, um, uh, with the business going forward. Or you have to take a write-off on some stock, which is just, it came with the business, but you can't sell it. So you'll have, um, in our accounts, always a non-underlying item of items that are cleared out and are not part of continued trading. So if you adjust it for those, and you'll see that the, the numbers are, are, are what we put here. Who are your major shareholders? Major shareholders, um, a number of big institutions, legal in general, uh, MNG, um, then we've got Polar, uh, so fairly large uh, institutions, Slater obviously also. These are the biggest institutional shareholders in, in London. Some smaller institutions behind it, Hargreef, Hale, Killick, Shard. Um, the largest individual two shareholders, but they're sort of on par with the bigger funds, are on the one hand a long-only investment fund out of the Channel Islands called the Bailiwick Fund, and then Stephen Lansdowne through Pula. So these are the individual uh, larger shareholders which make up 60-70% of, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the register so far. And the largest individual one is probably around 12%, 12, 13%, 12, and then a number of around about 10, and then it goes down. But that's all um, on the website, the first 10 or so, up to 3% holdings are all on there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.